Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Yifong, and with me are co-hosts Bob and Lily. Hello. Hello, Bob yeah. and Lily. Hello. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I always liked, I, I wish we, we had some sort of like uh, special codenames, like Maverick or something. <laughs> you guys. But anyways, we have, a, we have our first guest of the Watching Silent Film podcast. His name is Hey. Ooh. Welcome, Hey. Hey, hey. Thank you guys for having me. I can't wait to talk about, or ha, talk, pun intended, about some silent films. Um, Absolutely. Um, so what we hit, what we do here on this podcast is we, is we watch, you know, we pick a silent film feature or a series of shorts as, we, as we've done in the past. We watch it and talk about it. That's kind of what we do all day long. And I'm um, so thankful for Hey to, you know, take time out of his busy schedule to come and chat with us about uh, Our Hospitality which is a Buster Keaton film from 1923. And, uh, you know, if you've been paying attention to us, uh, uh, fellow listeners, you, you, you kind of know that we've been going through the Buster Keaton catalog, um, starting with some of his 1920 to 1923 shorts, shorts that he directed, and he basically, quote, unquote, graduated from directing shorts into features. So he's done a few features, and I think this would be his one, two, this is probably his second film. He did a first feature called Three Ages, which is like three separate kind of s stories, uh, you know, jammed into a single feature. But this is his second uh, feature called Our Hospitality in 1923. So before we get to our main feature, we have a segment here. We're just kind of briefly. Well, first of all, we're going to talk about, you know, Hay and where he comes from. And and then we're going to sort of talk about you know, what we've been watching lately in the silent realm or classic realm. And then we'll dive into the feature. Okay. <laughs> so for, for the first thing is, uh, Hey, this tell us, um, you, you have a podcast called all that film and just tell us a little bit about what made you, what, what, what compelled you to start this, uh, crazy sort of, uh, podcast yeah, uh, to talk about movies, all I'm, those movies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as, as most people like sort of start podcasts, uh, I just noticed me and my friends would get on voice because uh, because we're all in different parts of the world uh, and we get on voice and we talk about movies. And I was like, man, these are pretty good conversations. Like I've listened to worse podcasts before. So like there's there's at least something here if I just like turned on record. Um, it, what we do on all that film, though, is more it's not necessarily like recent films specifically. Like we recently did a tourney of the decade in review. Uh, so if you want to see like what we think uh, the best films of the 2010s are, you can check that out. Uh, it's in separate podcasts. But that's why I was so intrigued by this podcast, because it's such a change of pace uh, going into the silent realm. And, and honestly, I am I am very much not uh, in tune with that era as much. I think I have like three films I had seen before. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope mm -hmm. uh, what I'm hoping is like listening to y'all. Um, I'll get a sense of like which films to check out um, and which what they sort of signify for the era, um, because I hadn't even seen a, a Buster Keaton film yet. So this is this is my first. And where do you hail from? Uh, hey, uh, like what part of the States? Uh, Texas. Yeehaw. Um, I, I say y'all <laughs> occasionally, which I, I think has become like more normalized because it's unisex uh but I, I know like a couple people used to make fun of me because i said y'all and they're like oh you're from texas you have cows um <laughs> laughing now. well you don't have like, the real real deep no uh, i, I don't know. unfortunately yeah. i wish i wish i had that southern twang that a couple of my <laughs> texas constituents have um, <laughs> well at least you know how to imitate one. <laughs> I'm terrible at imitation. You can um, turn it on when you need to. <laughs> well, that's, that's that's really nice to hear. Um, thank you for, again, joining us on this uh, just merry venture of uh, going through silent films. Um, uh, most of our listeners know we've kind of gone over it in, in many podcasts in the past. But uh, a few sentences is just simply that I was searching for a silent film podcast and it didn't exist. And so... I created one, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, Bob and Lily are kind of my like, you know, you know, night, you know, sort of like the 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 knights of the round table, you know, not twelve, <laughs> but starting with two. <laughs> 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 and they got sharp swords and you know all that good stuff. So nice, nice. I can't wait to, to see the 
uh, extended 12 round table members of the silent <laughs> podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what what are some of your experiences um, with silent films? Uh, I know that at least the episodes I've heard, your podcast doesn't typically dive into that realm. You, you I think you guys eventually, you do re- reference some of the older films generally, but you don't reference like, the the as far as i i remember hearing not, oh no you're not, you're not, correct that that is definitely yeah. like we try to talk like there there were a couple you mentioned anything before star wars there are some films that like we've surely brought up uh from time to time uh but for the most part like we're in, we're not talking about you know like circus or um i'm trying to think of of some of the other ones uh like uh the the cabinet of dr caligari like caligari yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. those aren't like fresh on oh boy we gotta talk about these uh i've been trying to figure out how to incorporate that in an in interesting way uh because you're right like it, it is weird and I, I honestly i like i think it's great that you saw like a market for that not even a market it's just like i want to hear people talk about this no one's done that so i guess i'll talk about this because surely there's other people um but not many, not many, but <laughs> there's there's some. <laughs> um, um, and if you look look around some of the community there, they're generally um, not advanced in years, but they're they're gone on a little like you know they're probably averaging fifty, sixty, seventy plus. Yeah. Some of them actually live through um, uh, some of the original silence oh, when when they're on replay. So <laughs> I think the community. Is, it hasn't disappeared, but it's uh, it's not like something that you know young people flock to these days. But uh, <laughs> uh, on the other hand, I do think that um, people are interested in it. And the true f- film fans, it's like a gateway drug. All you need is one, <laughs> and once they kind of enjoy one, they 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 dive deep. You know, they dive deep right into it. Um, yeah, for sure. I think there is like a little bit of a, a of a stigma between people. I, I mean, I I know people that even think star wars is off-putting with how old like its effects are and like i sort of get that but it, you're right as soon as someone delves into an era and sort of understands like the the context of it i feel like they're able to enjoy it a whole lot more and find like, a lot of great films that the first one i had i had seen a couple chaplin films um going into silent films um but the one that really got me more interested um because i thought city lights was okay um i watched the great dictator as well uh both are like pretty solid um but i actually really like safety last um i think it Harold Lloyd. Trem- yeah. yeah yeah i think it holds up tremendously um really funny movie uh, and that and that's one of the, like the interesting things going back to the to these um i think there's some comedies that have released in the past year uh that don't have like the a comedy that can age as well as this stuff which is crazy um but yeah that, safety last is probably one that i usually turn to and i'm like hey if if you want to check out a silent film that's probably the one i would recommend that is uh not a bad one to start with um i would say that you know your word context we spent like the first few podcast episodes in the early ages of this podcast just talking about that the fact that you need some of those contexts in order mm-hmm. to enjoy really any art, not just films. Like if you're going to read the Odyssey, you know, from Homer, <laughs> Homeric stuff, like yeah. y- you can, I guess, start reading it. But also it is good to know about the context of why he was doing the things the way he was. I mean, he was a uh, he was an orator, you know, he would memorize the stories and then retell them from memory, you know. And like you got to know some details in the context of how people told stories. And then when they finally write them down. It makes more sense, and plus, if you go back to the original, like Greek, and it, it rhymes, and and there there are all these sort of uh, rhythmic poet, and that's the reason why is because your memory you can memorize things better when it's poetic, because of those mnemonic devices and the way your brain works, you know. And so, so it's great, like like literature, but also if you figure out sort of the context of how to enjoy classics, just in general, I think it, it'll go a long way to sort of helping you appreciate that art, you know. Like if you go to like same thing if you go to M- like a museum of fine arts anywhere and you kind of like oh this is not so interesting in painting you could like go, go buy a Mona Lisa and be like ah oh, that's kind of small <laughs> and it is it's not that big and it's like 
all right, but you, you, you just miss like some of the greatest Renaissance painters of all time. Some of the greatest artists, the masters, they call it, you know, because it's all about that context, right? Like you were saying. Yeah. I, I, I've been, uh, (laughs) I've been one of those people at an art museum. My, my girlfriend's really into art. Um, and we went to a museum and there are a couple paintings that I was just like, eh, not doing it for me. And she's like, this is like one of the, like someone put their whole life into this. And I was like, eh, doesn't look that good. <laughs> it's okay. We, we've had a number of uh, movies like that on this podcast. <laughs> oh so. my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. All right. So um, what was that movie you were saying you, you watched in the classic realm? Oh, yeah. Um, So recently, uh, we actually ended up switching doing what we were talking about. Um, On our podcast this week, uh, in honor of Pride Month, we were just sort of talking like best uh, LGBT films. Uh, There was this one that I was confused about, and I'll explain why here in a second. Um, But I was confused because it was a 50s era film that was getting recommended to me. And I was like, surely it is not like up front a gay film there is no way it was released in the 50s um and i watched it and there's definitely um some subtext there um we were going to do uh a history of lgbt films but that ended up being a little bit too expansive same with same with silent films i you know i wrote that down on the schedule and i was like oh my gosh i'm gonna have to watch like at least 25 movies if i want to like cover this well enough and and you know know what i'm talking about um but it's it's called sorry I forgot to mention the film's name. It's called Johnny Guitar. It came out in 1954. Um, it's like an oddly feminist western, and I know like multiple people have said this, and I I knew that going in, but I was like, what does that even mean? And I sort of get it. Basically, like it's two mob bosses in different like western gangs, and they're both females, and they both sort of hate each other, but like maybe love each other i guess is the sub subtext part um it's a really in- interesting watch i don't think it's like the the greatest western there is um i know a lot of westerns of the 40s and 50s can be a little bit hard to go to i think this one's pretty accessible um so if anybody's wanting to check that out i, I think it's like an interesting milestone it, it almost got forgotten in time though i i know um trying to remember who the lead actress is uh joan crawford joe yeah joan crawford yeah Um, but yeah it's 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 an interesting watch to say the least bob you heard that one before you kind of like westerns right uh never i i do like westerns i've never heard of it now it's directed by nicholas ray uh stars joan crawford sterling hayden um mercedes mc cambridge ernest Borgini, Scott Brady, 1954. I will say, because we are talking about classic films, uh, the one thing for sure that I will, I will always point to, because I think you're looking at the same thing, uh, there is no beating posters pre-80s era, or even oh, yeah. in the 80s era. Just those hand-drawn posters, yeah. ooh, they look so nice. It's, a, it's kind of a lost art. I would say the... Uh, the the art just sort of poster art in general nowadays you kind of a template and people just fill the template in like yeah, every that, single movie has the same exact <laughs> template it's either like yeah. it's either like you know three colors and there are three characters that have nothing to do with each other <laughs> not even have to do with the film it's just that template they're like ah that's that's yeah. you know photoshop this template in and yeah. deliver it and send it out and it, there's a lot there's a lot less thought i think in in the art of selling movies yeah. Versus, you know, yeah, I agree. versus years, years past when, I, you know, the artwork itself, the poster is art unto itself, separate from the movie, you know? Yeah. I, I do like that Star Wars still has like one classic poster, even with its newer movies every time. Oh, I well, they have really to because cool. it's tradition. I yeah. Think. Yeah. <laughs> even if uh, it's like the rise of the Skywalker. <laughs> Let's not go there. So, um, yeah. So. Anyway, so Nicholas Ray is one of the um, most sort of popular directors of the time. He he's most well known for Rebel Without a Cause. With, yeah, um, I actually haven't seen that one. I, that's one of the ones on my list that I'm like, man, I should check this out. But I have like very few yeah, classics. James left, Dean, if that yeah, makes James sense. Yeah, James Dean. He yeah. also did uh, Bigger Than Life, which is 
another huge classic. Uh, they live by night in a lonely place and on a. Some of these Western tropes towards that era are are they've become more deconstructions of Westerns. Would you say, Bob? Like in the, in the er- early era, Westerns are huge, right? They're just kind of like Pulp Fiction essentially. And then I'd say it peaks. It peaked probably 30s, 40s. Would you say? Maybe a lot later. The, I'm not sure what you're talking about. So the, the the genre of westerns and film. The genre of westerns was really big in the 50s. It, it was still pretty big, but I think that yeah. that era started. They started. I mean, you had a out. you had your your weekend movie. They, they were coming out almost. <laughs> it was almost like every week there was a movie of the week kind of western that you'd go and see at the theater. The what I'm trying to say is in the 50s and 60s was when they started to experiment with things and try to branch out into a, a like yeah, stereotypical I, Western. I would definitely agree with that. In the, in the 60s, it was definitely branching out quite a bit. Yeah. And then they, they sort of become more anti-Westerns, I think, in time, like um, that really big one, Sam uh, Peckinpah. Sam Peckinpah. Yeah, he's, he, he did... Um, yeah, Peckinpah was name. unconventional. <laughs> the Wild Bunch, so 1969. Oh, yes. It's revisionist Western, you know. This is post the, you know, the, the good, the, the good, bad, ugly and stuff era. And then afterwards, right. Westerns were just like, ah, oh, it's too much violence, except like we're going to do another capstone on violence and studying violence. It's, it's kind of like a, a more recent example was like Unforgiven. I was going to mention that, yeah. Yeah, with uh, Clint Eastwood and also... Um, Kevin Costner did one in two thousands. I'm forgetting the name. I think they're going for a less romanticized and more realistic view of a western. Right, right, right. But so the heroes aren't. It, it's you know, kind of deconstructing westerns, and even with this movie, um, the uh, Joan Crawford movie, there, that's their Johnny Guitar. They were starting to do that. You know, instead of the male leads, they put in female leads. It's like, oh, and doing different things with it so that's the point i was trying to make tying into what hey was talking about <laughs> were, were you talking about about dances with wolves by chance uh <laughs> no i was movie? talking about i was talking about um i i don't know the name of it now but it's in 2003 it's one of the best westerns i've seen i mean he's done a lot of westerns i think he, but he has done a ton of I think it's 2003 open range there you go so open range is very similar to unforgiven in theme but it's one of the greatest westerns post the year 2000 for sure gotcha. yeah there's yeah. there's definitely been some um incorporations of western elements I, I i think it's good you'll bring that up especially with unforgiven um but even more so to almost to a fault i think um for some people but i it, it's what makes it excel for me. Logan, 2017, I feel like really like... Oh, the uh, Wolverine starts, thing. Yeah, it starts with yeah, being yeah. a weapon. Then it's like, okay... That's because but, of James Mangold, that's why. Yeah, yeah. Mangold is <laughs> yeah. really good at that stuff. Um, yeah. So. Cool. All right, Lily, what was that thing that you were watching? That silent that you started? Uh, it is called... Uh, Put you on the spot. Uh, let me find it. <laughs> when the Earth... Yeah, I know. When the Earth trembled, but I I only just started it because I was reading the credits because it's a film yep. from 1913, and Disaster they're just talking about there's three about different the earthquake. Yeah. yeah, there's three different versions of it. Like the the eye has a piece of it, MoMA has a piece of it, and then the BFI has another piece. So they had to combine them. So some have like the Dutch intertitles, but with English subtitles, and then vice versa because there's no complete com- from yeah. one country so that was interesting i just found it from the san francisco silent film festival because i followed them on twitter <laughs> so i was like oh what do they got to offer me this week See, Lily, Ooh, this I think looks you've, good. you've uh graduated from a uh a uh sort of uh sort of uh what do you call it uh like early learner or whatever that term into a master now because you're using terms that hey probably doesn't even know anymore <laughs> <laughs> i hope so <laughs> like the i and moma and stuff you're talking like an insider now um that's when you know yeah. it's you're crossing you're crossing over <laughs> um the i is a, a danish or dutch um sort of institute or organization for arts in general and yeah. they help pre- preserve silent films 
Um, somewhere in the Nordic. Can't remember. I was going to say, I think they're in Norway because it doesn't. Yeah, Norway. I couldn't remember. But somewhere yeah. out there. Somewhere and MoMA up is, there. Yes. The MoMA is a Museum of uh, Modern Arts, which is in New York City. And they do uh, a lot of business with uh, the Library of Congress to help preserve film negatives and um, just just so that, you know, a lot of the silent film. And as a side note, uh, we kind of have to remember that Hayes kind of like uh, kind of dropped into the deep end of silent films here. So we got to yeah, little, little baby pro- silent film thing. provide some context <laughs> for him as we were just talking about earlier. So the context is that like something like 80, 90 percent of silent films are lost and the ones that are available are in pieces. Often they're not mm-hmm. complete. Mm-hmm. And so if you look at the film quality, um, Buster Keaton is one of the greatest ones. So he he often gets a lot of love and attention like Chaplin and Harold Lloyd's. So their films are very well preserved. And in fact, this film, our hospital has gone to two or three uh, restorations. Like I have the Kino Blu-ray from 10 years ago and that was like one of the second either second or third restorations and if you check it out on uh, canopy that's already another fourth or fifth restoration the 2018 2019 restoration so they get looked at quite a bit these films but if you were like some well i'll give you an example like the one that lily is trying to watch they they might get the shaft you know like (laughs) what's this and who who is this and nobody cares about it so the film quality is often really choppy, really scratchy. And, you know, and if the film is lost then then all is lost, you know what I mean? So <laughs> it's kind of surprising, but that's, that's how films are. Um, is silent films are, they, they, they are kind of, when they were making these films, they, there weren't VHS, there weren't DVDs, there weren't any playback <laughs> medium. They were just the original films, right? So if you had the film negative, you could project them somewhere to, to make some money. But after the initial runs, they fall by the wayside. Somebody, if they're lucky, they keep them. If not, they kind of move on. That's why, like, a big chunk of it is lost because no one at that in in the 1910s, 20s, and even 30s could even think that far into the future how there's a shiny disc or even uh, computers <laughs> that could play back movies. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, so far in the future, nobody thinks about that. They're just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> like, this was work for them. This was making money, right? And they weren't even thinking about preserving anything uh, of value or history. I mean, that slowly came into being probably in the late 20s and early 30s. And that's why a great deal of the films before that are lost. Just uh, provide some context. Gotcha. Yeah, it, it is interesting because even, and may, maybe I should stop referencing uh, newer films, but I know like preserving films was even uh, a thing in like the 2000s because they almost lost. Uh, Toy Story 2 or Toy Story? I forget which one it was, but Pixar almost really? lost the... Yeah, they almost lost... The, I think it was Toy Story 2. Uh, they almost lost like all of the computer files for the film. Um, and it's just so interesting because that never... I feel like that would never happen like 20 years uh, from Toy Story 2. Uh, so it's just interesting that like, yeah, like if you had lost uh, the actual... The physical film that it was presented on and if you didn't make a copy like that's it you're you're done like no one's gonna remember your movie after that um it's it's crazy right and i, I love how there's this old i don't know if it's an old adage or there's some saying out there a phrase saying film is forever I'm like film is not quite forever <laughs> I know. <laughs> Look at all these silent really. films they're they're truly not forever i mean i understand the 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 feeling of like oh if you commit it to film it is forever but if nobody sees it or if it's gone then it's not forever <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. so, so i just love that notion that people have that it's gonna still be around when in reality so much of the performance is lost right from, from yep. the silent film era definitely mm. especially especially for the cases you're talking about where you know they've got parts of them but it's still not a full movie um like that's not the same presentation that 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 team you know, intended. That is probably the standard um, for most films that are our remnants, like, like the silent films that are remaining still that we have access to. Um, some of them are just pieced together from various different things. Um, it, it, you know, if nobody else has uh, other sort of things that they watched recently in the classic realm, we can move into the feature. Is that okay? Yeah. Bob, so you good? Sure. Yep. Mm-hmm. So let's move into our hospitality. Um, you know, it's a natural segue into the fact that our hospitality itself has had a uh, there's a hour and ten minute or something version 
And then there is a uh, 50 minute version or hour version of something like that with 10, 15 minutes cut hmm. in the UK. And uh, that version is called Hospitality without the word R. Hmm. And then later on, it got cha- its name changed into R Hospitality. So even this film that we're talking about this today, it has multiple cuts. And, you know, having multiple cuts is kind of standard for silent films. And if you think about it, the reason is because if they finish the movie, let's say they're in California, they make a movie, and when they're done, they have to make uh, duplicates. And when they make duplicates and they send it off to, you know, Wichita, and they send it to Michigan, and they send it to wherever, well, the the branch that gets it often has to splice in um, advertisement and other things, right? When they, like, it's not just shown as is. And if they feel like it's a little too long for some of their other programs they're trying to fit in, they're often fitting in cartoons. So a, 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 a little bit more context for you, hey. So a lot of these, these films are shown as part of a program depending on what year of the silent film era. In the te- 19-teens and 19-teens and before, they were just coming from agrarian age, people who are farmers and just, you know, people from all walks of life. They would go into some sort of like a... Uh, auditorium a single building in their town to for various entertainment it could be live performance of olivelle it could be people juggling it could be the circus so you could have animals you could have people you could all sorts of smells and people who are f- coming from the farm like directly farm animals you have smells there <laughs> sitting next to you it's not like you know those movie palaces that you imagine that came into being sort of the late 20s and early 30s but prior to that that's how people were watching movies uh, if they were just day-to-day average joes and so those guys um y- you would you would throw in a feature film uh usually towards the end so they would watch a bunch of live performances it's sort of like um what we know now at least more modern is called the ed sullivan show or shows like that or uh, the mary tyler moore show a lot of them are have variety stuff like if you ever watched some of that stuff and sort of the the tv land or something like that if you watch any of those I have before, <laughs> uh, so to provide some context, some of those shows, uh, maybe closer would be like Conan, maybe or like oh um, yeah 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 I Letterman. get I so I those, have like a mental picture of what you were talking about, but yeah no that that makes sense. So those talk shows often have a variety of things. Sometimes they'll have a, a comedian come on, or like Letterman when he was still on. If you remember that, he has a stupid human trick yep. thing segment. They have it's a variety show. It, 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 all those talk show formats come from the Johnny Carson, which is based on the Ed Sullivan, and there's a long lineage of stuff like that. It's basically it's like a program full of variety of stuff. Hence, variety shows, talk shows, variety shows. To me, they're all synonymous. I I know the format has evolved over the years, and they have something they they mean something sp- specific today. But to me, they're all like one and the same. And of course. The variety shows in the 50s and 60s and even the talk shows of today all come from the vaudeville entertainment days of when you're like, you know, you're <laughs> milking a cow, you're doing hay, you're doing farming <laughs> stuff. When you're done, you, you're like, oh, it's a, let's go to town hall. <laughs> so they go to town hall and sit next to each other. And then here comes a bunch of performers. performances. Could be some monkeys, some animal trick stuff, some elephant circus stuff. And then they run through and then once they're done, Barnum and Bailey type stuff, and then you know they might have people who are vaudeville, some tricks and laughs, and you kind of on and on for the rest of the evening. And to cap it off, usually there's like a a silent film towards the end, some sort of short, like a Buster Keaton short, and and so on. So that's the context in which the 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 original silent films, which would often have an accompanist, by the way. So it's never truly silent. People just don't sit there, and there's no music. <laughs> there's always some sort of you, you know some sort of accompaniment which is usually um, improvised, you know. So you have a musician, pianist, or organist, mm-hmm. and they would watch the the uh, the movie and they'd kind of create their own scores. Sometimes the scores would come with the movie. Sometimes they there are written ones. Some More often than not, they're... Accom- they're... So uh, that's kind of the early days of the silent film era. In the mid, like towards around the 20s, they start to become more formalized. So you would, you would go watch a stretch of movies, uh, films, project it not just uh they, i think they moved away from those performances um because people are more industrialized they're getting away from the sur- suburbs and the agrarian society now they're moving to the bur- urban and city like sort of uh they're like they're like their lifestyle is changing so they might be in a factory uh and they're done at five they clock out and they might have a happy hour and then they go into this 
darkened theater and they'd be watching these movies and then there would be a series of movies. It'd be, it could be shorts, it could be some news, news reels, and then it could be some sort of um, travel log. Like, here, go to this country, this is, and you'll see a bunch of those black and whites if you look, look on YouTube, some really old clips of like, travel to Tahiti for nine ninety nine, <laughs> And like, that's what they were doing. They were advertising, also some travel logs, some educational stuff. And it finally arrived at the short, like, I mean, at the movie. So like, our hospitality would be shown at the end of all that stuff you know you thought that previews were long now but you would have to endure <laughs> like a 10 minute 15 minute you know short cartoons travelogue newsreels and then you get to your features you know which is why they're not always like two hours um these uh silent films sometimes they're just you know hour and hour and 10 hour and 80 minutes uh, hour and um 10 minutes hour 20 minutes instead of a full two hours um anyways that's some context for your hey yeah, gotcha. um, I, I do so, like that they're they're uh, they're not two hours long. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, like I can I can uh, really enjoy a four hour film if if like it's really well made. But it's nice every now and then to get an easy breezy like the, like you were saying. This is seventy three minutes. Yeah, um, but they do make them though. It's a it's sometimes shocking to know like um, uh, Abel Gantz, which is a amazing director who made a five and a half hour movie on Napoleon using an epic format. Yeah. The initial version of Cinemascope. <laughs> and then you have you would have Greed. Greed is another uh, Eric von Steinheim's uh, lost epic. Most of that film is gone. There's probably half of it left. Uh, it's a four-hour, four, four to five-and-a-half-hour epic based on a novel. So wow. it's pretty common back then, I'd say, in some instances, some people at, at least, when, they're, when, they're got, when the studios were indulging them, <laughs> some of For these sure. artisans. <laughs> Um, anyway, getting back onto the point of our hospitality. So when you send these film duplicates from the original source, the film studios, they make copies. Let's say I made 100 copies. Well, by the time it gets to the local branch, um, again, you're competing with time, right? So if people have a two-hour block and you have hour and 10, 20 minutes, it's like, eh, it's a little long. I want to show more of my cartoons, you know? <laughs> and they might fit more cartoons in there, right? And then they'll chop like 10, 15 minutes off of hospitality they become the editors nobody mm. back then cared about like artisan rights and that that came later i think <laughs> like towards the 20s and, and even in this era and mid 20s and later 20s the artists were starting to feel like hey what are you guys doing you're like messing my movie up and they, mm. then they started to have legal lawyers up and all sorts of things like you can't chop my movie up and you have to show the full thing and there's you know director's rights artisan right blah 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 so that all started to, to, to arrive but that's why, you know, you potentially in the early days of uh, silent films, you could have a hundred different cuts of a movie, and two or three of those might be preserved, and then you'd have to take an amalgam of all three to get what might be the original cut of what was intended by the director. You know what I mean? For sure. Anyways, I'm just uh, giving you some background on why there are different cuts all around, and have there's no like quote unquote director's cut back then. It's, there's I, so many different cuts. I do think it would be kind of cool. I, I know it would be extremely... I, I've thought about this, like, releasing films uh, in different locations with different, like, variations or, like, different jokes to, like, encourage people to see oh, yeah. more often. They've done that recently. Um, Will Ferrell, some com some comedy... Uh, what's this called? Anchorman. They did that for Anchorman with different endings, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I know the they... They famously did it with Clues as well. Um, right. So it's been experimented on from the early days and even now. But it's, yeah, it's, it is interesting. <laughs> yeah, it Basically, is. there there were no um, there were no like laws or, or rules set out, so you could be like, oh, uh, you have this uh, one hour and twenty minute movie. Well, it's fifty five minutes now, and I took out your best joke. Uh, so <laughs> we're still gonna show it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Anyway, so that's kind of kind of going on some of that, but um, let's get into the actual plot here. So, um, the high-level plot summary of this film is that it's it's kind of a a take on sort of the real life uh, Hatfield McCoy's uh, historic event. Um, there's some mm. differences. Uh, the, the real life Hat, Hatfield and uh, McCoy sort of. Uh, uh, history event took place uh, post-Civil War, 1863 to 1891. 
it's a really messy story, so I can't get too much into it. But I'm going to give you a high-level cliff notes or summary of it is that uh, there's two families, Hatfield and McCoys, and they live on either side of the river. I think it's Potomac. I didn't I don't remember the actual river. But they live on different sides from the uh, West Virginia and Kentucky border. And most of the family fought for the Confederates, except for one, Asa, I think, ASA, from the McCoy. No, from the Hat, Hatfield side of family. He joined the Union side for some real reason. And that caused some friction. And, you know, when he came back home, there's a lot of sort of, um, I don't know, hatred towards the fact that he went on the other side instead of all being Confederates. And long story short, he got killed. And the McCoys banned Hatfield for killing him. And then there was a whole family feud, right? In fact, there are some real life uh, elements of that family feud that would bleed into this um, our, our hospitality film. In the sense that there was um, one of the uh, cousins, uh, Eleanor McCoy, fell in love with one of the Hatfields. And then one of the Hatfields then ditched her, like got her pregnant, ditched her, and went for a younger cousin of McCoy. So it's like really, you know, dramatic. And by the end, it was like, you know, multiple people dead and, you know, nine people in jail, something like that. It was, it was something ridiculous, you know, lifelong feud. Um, Buster Keaton sort of took on that story using Canfield and McKay's instead of Hatfield McCoy's, but he rewound the clock. He made it pre-Civil War in 1810 to 1830. He wound back the clock. And I think if you recognize that, that explains some of the technological things that are happening in the film. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that it was one of the first r early versions of the steam engine train. Like it's not yep. like the fully formed engine that we know today. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And also, like the the gun, you have to use the powder. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was and, funny. <laughs> yeah, there's no like the the the, the cult revolver. Uh, the the actual film story majority of it takes place in around 1830. The the cult revolver didn't come out until 1839, nine years mm -hmm. after that 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 sort of historic event in in the context of the movie. And that's why the reloading is crazy and um, things like that, you know. And also that bike, the bicycle. Uh, that starts off the movie. Yeah, towards the beginning there. That was, I thought that was wonderful. It's a predecessor to the bicycle that we know today, but it's still yep. not. <laughs> it's a, it was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. It's called a dandy horse. But <laughs> Anyway, so th <laughs> that's part of the reason why I think Buster wanted to sort of rewound the clock so that he can play with all these gadgets because, again, uh, we've covered this in the past, hey, but in general, Buster Keaton is this, like, you know, he was studying to be like a civil engineer if it weren't for acting. Like he could have just been a regular old engineer. And he loved to tinker with, you know, sets, buildings. They almost become characters in all of his films, whether it's houses that are flying and going crazy or boats uh, or in this case, trains. I mean, he loves trains. Yeah, uh, that's, he was... that's very apparent even in this yes. film. Um... He grew up um, basically living on trains because his dad, who is actually the engineer, uh, uh, of the of the train itself, like Joe Keaton, his father is in the movie. Uh, his dad and his mom and himself formed the the Keaton Three, and they were a vaudeville act in the early days in the 1900s. And uh, they did they traveled the the country on trains, and so it is partly because of his sort of upbringing of just being sort of a nomad, living on trains that he loves trains. As a result of that, I think. It helped develop in him, instill in him this incredible lifelong love for trains and what it means to be, you know, on trains as part of this fabric of this country, I think. So that that's, a, I think, a big part of a lot of his films. Um, but anyways, uh, let me go through some of the plot element and then we'll just kind of dive in. So the plot itself is, uh, how do I break this down? <laughs> So the plot is that um, the Canfield and McCoys have been feuding for so long, no one remembers, apparently. And uh, that's kind of the prologue. And in the prologue, they're, these two families are killing each other. And finally, they're, they're, now they're just uh, some sort of babies left, right? And so on one side of the family, the Canfields are vowing to you know, continue to kill the McKays. Meanwhile, the mother of the McKay kid was basically done with the feud and said, we're going to stop this. So she sent him off, uh, ignorant of sort of the family feud. And so he would grow up uh, 20 years later, who, you know, eventually he becomes the Buster Keaton character. 
uh, ignorant of that. And so then um, he got this letter of inheritance about the McKay quote unquote estate uh, back in New York City. And so he comes back to New York City to try to claim his home. And as I often say, hilarity ensues. <laughs> so a lot mm -hmm. of stuff that goes on after that high level. <laughs> um, the structure of the film, there are about four or five parts, I would say. The first part is the prologue that kind of introduces the feud and the killings and stuff. And then there's sort of the, the train sequence, I would say. A lot of yep. the gags and stuff like that around the train. Yes, and then the when travel. He arrives, yeah, and when he arrives in New York and that whole New York uh, it would be another set piece. And then the sort of the house itself, the Kentucky house would be another set piece for the Canfield house, our mansion. And then there's this uh, river slash waterfall sequence. And then there's this sort of the, the uh, that leads into the ending. So there's three, four, five, or four or five sections, I'd say, of this film. Uh, but let's uh, get an overall impression, go around. Uh, hey, you're our guest, so why don't you take us through your first impressions of, and this is the first Buster Keaton film you've seen? Yes, this yeah, feature? so this is the first one. I, I probably should have watched some of the shorts, um, but I, I wound up being a little bit more um, crunched for time this week. Um, this this was a, a very nice surprise in, in a couple of ways. Um one because like you you sort of mentioned uh he doesn't really lean on jokes in the start and i was like oh well this is interesting i guess like um and i think i think i had confused this with being i thought buster keaton did uh safety last um so i i was a little uh confused from the start uh even though i was like oh okay this is cool like kind of world building uh even though it's a film from 23 um so i did like some of that stuff and i do think it leads to some of the best jokes um i think it's like you were saying it's really interesting to see someone's eye that wanted to be like a tinker and sort of go above and beyond um in some of the different set pieces they use um so for that reason like I i'm definitely interested to see what buster keaton does in the rest of his films uh, but yeah, overall, uh, this film was really fun. I think there's a couple of like clever jokes they do, um, clever sequences, uh, and it's really well shot. Uh, the score, as always, um, for these films is really good. But yeah, no, this was this was really fun. I'm glad this is the one that I decided on um, for this podcast. If you had to pick one modern uh entertainer uh either independent films or hollywood who would you say that buster keen approximates okay the personality and the person and what he does in, in the context um, of films i mean just, when you were talking the first one that came to mind i don't think they're similar in the actual projects they put out uh, but james cameron immediately comes to mind just because he also nice. has a, a, <laughs> a civil engineering background and he's one of those guys where he just he just wants to do things in movies and i know as of late like cameron has sort of been clowned for avatar 2 taking nearly a decade or well i think we're at a decade now um but yeah. taking a decade to come out but it's just one of those things i have a lot of uh respect for him because he's one of those people where he's like well if the tech isn't ready i'm not going to do it and i'm just going to keep pushing it and when i'm not i'm going to be going in my submarine in the depths of the the ocean that have been undiscovered it's like man this guy's you should you should do a tourney between uh buster's movies and james cameron and james movies. cameron <laughs> get, get aliens so just explain our hospitality yeah, just explain for uh the people who don't know that on his podcast he likes to do these uh movies kind of you have to pick one i guess right kind of sh shoot shoot sort of battle to the death and <laughs> what movie would you pick and <laughs> and then ultimately, it, it's or sort of like the March Madness, right, of movies type stuff. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, we actually, if you were up... stuck on a desert island, you could only have yeah, one something... movie to watch for the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess how to some of the other ones. It, it, it's interesting you bring up the March Madness. Uh, if anybody's listening to this who hasn't watched sports, I'll sort of ex explain it in rudimentary terms. Basically, there's like play-in tourneys before the actual big tourney. Uh, it's kind of silly, but a lot of people love it. I love it. Uh, it's tons of fun. We sort of did that for topics like 
best horror film of the 2010s and whatever one would advance into the tourney. Um, but yeah, I definitely look forward. I, I would be interested to eventually, uh, may, maybe if I've seen more silent films, uh, do a tourney with y'all and determine the best silent film. Um, hmm. That would be fun. That might be interesting. <laughs> Ooh, so many to choose from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Lily. What do you think of this one? Um, I will say I liked it a lot better than last week's. I wrote, you know, just my note was it was a very charming film. And just to confirm, this is his second directorial I believe so, film? yeah. Okay, yeah. just comparing it to the first one, it's definitely more structured. Uh, maybe it was just because he did those three separate ages between the stone, the Roman, and the modern. It, I was just kind of like, okay, same story, different different time. Because this one was just kind of straightforward, it just felt easier to follow along with. And it just kind of seemed more... Uh, was, I don't know, I felt... It just seemed he... It's a lot more cohesive. Would you yeah, say? it's more cohesive. And I think because it's like round two, once you get over that hump of round one and, you know, you're going to have your bumps because it's the first time doing something by yourself because, you know, like I said, you write it, wrote, directed, produced, starred. I mean, that's pretty intense, especially when it's your first film, even though he had been doing it prior to the, with the shorts. But now that he has this one under his belt, it's, you can tell that, He's uh, achieved the goals he couldn't achieve with the previous film, at least in my opinion. But yeah, I think uh, you, you bring up a good point. I mm-hmm. mean, the, the Three Ages was basically three separate short films, mm-hmm. which is kind of we talked about last week. Yeah, uh, is it last week? I can't remember now. It feels mm-hmm. like long ago, but it's uh, it's basically like Clout Atlas. You remember uh, Tom Hanks? Clout Atlas. No, I remember you mentioning that. Yeah. I haven't seen that film either. I am the worst with films. Like, That's okay. it's basically like <laughs> multiple stories where they multiple all take Tom diff- Hanks's, uh, in different timelines, <laughs> and then <laughs> ultimately, <laughs> and ultimately, they all sort of have some sort of motif that kind of play across the entire structure of the movie saying oh we're trying to make a point you know so that's kind of mm-hmm. like three ages you know that, yeah. that's why I, I think that's one of the reasons i like it so much because of that charm of the multiple timelines but also multiple it's the same you know actor in all three timeline roles it's the same story but mm-hmm. just it just has resonance to me that i didn't realize remember when i was first watching it but anyway so I think the part of the reason for setting up the second one was he hired all the usual suspects, I'd call it. Like, he had his wife, Natalie yeah. uh, Talmadge, play the, the main co-star, you know. His dad is in here. He had J- Big Joe. And these are, uh, by the way, hey, these are all regulars, I'd call. Like, he, he worked with, uh, not his wife, but all the other ones he worked with many times before. Like, his dad, he would plug him in many of his shorts. He would often show up. Um, mm-hmm. like Big Joe, the the father of the the Catfield, the patriarch. Mm-hmm. He's his a family friend basically, uh, from the Vaudeville days. So he knows actually his dad, uh, Buster Keaton's dad, who's the engineer of the train. So they didn't know each other like a family from from way back. So he, for for whatever reason, Buster likes to put him in his movies as kind of the big baddie, and uh, he's kind of the archetype of uh, Fatty Arbuckle. Who Fatty Arbuckle is the guy that mentored um, Buster Keaton, and so he has a type, right, that he's going for for all his films. He likes to be, he likes to have contrast of these big, tall guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Versus him, you know. It, that that guy specifically seemed like uh, I was wondering if there was like context for that because I was like, this seems, even though it's like twenty three, and that, I I don't know if there's because I didn't know if there were too many movies before this that Keaton had done. I was like, this guy seems like he's been in these movies before, and this sort oh, of yeah. like playing into his trope. Like he sort of feels the way he like has a presence on screen. Um, just feels they're like comfortable a star. with each other. Yeah. yeah, they're comfortable with each other. That's that's I think my point is, and going back to Lily's point is that the first movie, he, the reason why he did three separate stories is in case it didn't work, and the studio people are like, this is garbage. You could split the three. Uh, movies as short movies because he's used to short movies and kind of sell them that way. So they're not just a single movie, you know? And I think this is, if you take that first movie out called Three Ages and you would just say, this is the first feature, this would probably be the first feature. I think that's kind of the point, mm-hmm. right, Lily? Like, yeah, this is that almost this real quote unquote first feature 
because he's not trying to make short movies to, to, to yeah. make sure he has insurance in case people don't like him. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. So there's a lot more confidence, I think, as a director mm-hmm. by this point. I mean, Buster's had, uh, you know, by the time he came onto the movie scene in 1917, he's already had like 17 plus years of experience in vaudeville theater. So he's well experienced as a performer, entertainer um since he was age four or five or something you know so he's he's you know he's been around for a long time in entertainment in 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 general and since 1917 under the tutelage of uh, uh fatty art buckle he he gained a lot of knowledge about how to work the camera how to work his visual effects how to create the gag the perfect gag and he worked with them until 1920 and then he did his short he's got multiple eras in his career but and then he did his short he directed his started to direct his own and after that, now he's graduating to features. That's so we're into his prime. I think a lot of these, fe- starting with this one, and you can argue with the one before this, but this is second feature. It's not. It doesn't really feel like a sophomore effort. It feels mm. like this confident director is just kind of arriving on the scene. So, mm-hmm. what what do you think about that, Bob? The film. Yeah, film. Yeah. What do you think overall? I liked it. I liked it quite a bit. I um. I mean, there were a lot of individual things that stood out to me. Um, the overall story seemed a little predictable, but yeah. uh, that's typical of most most of the films back then. They get married. <laughs> yeah, it uh, it took a couple twists that surprised me. I mean, I uh, I expected when the preacher came into the house when they had dinner that the parson, an old term, the parson. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh oh the vicar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um he uh that he that I, I predicted I, I suspected then that he was gonna ask her to marry him and he was she, he was gonna marry her before he ever had to leave the house and thwart them. Well, because <laughs> he did that so many times in his shorts. It would end with a wedding or proposal or uh uh-huh. married. Uh-huh. So But the getting dressed up getting switching to the dress to to get away I thought was just, was pretty funny. I mean, he's yeah. done that before as well, but yep. But there I still think gags. it's pretty funny. I mean, yeah. And but, I mean, there were so many things that made me laugh. I mean, I thought it was I thought it was very funny. I, I loved the fact that it was when they were going to shoot him when he's walking away in the dress and the parasol that uh, it turned out to be the horse. I mean, it was like that <laughs> just cracked me up. The horse's rear end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, I mean there was there were so many things that just made me laugh. Yeah, well, we'll kind of kind of comb through it a little bit. Um, the first thing is this was shot in July and released in November of 1923, so it didn't take long at all. Basically, just over a summer, and of course, he hmm. probably had pre-production preparations and stuff. And he already made Three Ages earlier in the year, uh, and Three Ages was released a few months after this, uh, before this was released, actually. Yep. So he got sort of. Uh, notoriety even before this movie was released and of course this movie's just adding to yep. everything he filmed a lot of this stuff um the river scenes especially in a Truckee river uh if that sounds familiar it's because Truckee river touches lake tahoe which is in the corner of california and i think utah or is it utah, utah right yeah nevada? i think so what state am i thinking of <laughs> okay, what state oh nevada <laughs> no I think it's probably Utah. I gotta look at it again. But um, if you look at the map, it borders on that. That that it's right in the corner. If you look at the, the I think that's the, Nevada. Then the eastern border of uh, California <laughs> is where that angle comes along. But yeah, <laughs> yeah Nevada. Uh, now, I, now I'm questioning my own self. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I like to do. Make you question your states. <laughs> I didn't know I'd have to come with geography. If, uh, I know, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so the reason why that's important is because uh, his final short called "The Frozen North" was shot in Lake Tahoe, and during like a snowy, blizzardy season, he hmm. took his crew up and he shot a bunch of uh, frozen North scenes in that area. So he kind of he's up to his old tricks, as it were. He's shooting back in familiar ground. I mean, he would be filming this um in and around if the 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 river and you would stop and uh during breaks play baseball it's kind of like a family it really is like a family sort of familiar feel uh for his um even though it's a, a second effort in directing it just feels like he, he takes everything that he's familiar with and kind of rolling with it 
And he also shot a lot of the train sort of sequence in Oregon, further up north. Um, because it's kind of this movie is kind of like practice for the general uh, in another two or three years. So, in, and he shot most of the general, the train scenes in, um, in Oregon. So, which is doubling for like, the uh, Georgia stretch all the way to Tennessee, which is what that movie takes place in. So, anyways, that's some back production background there, just so you know. Um, when the movie starts, um, before the movie even started, uh, one of the reasons why Buster King wants to kind of tackle this is because I, th I think he was not tired of gags, but he really wanted to be taken seriously as a film director in general and not just uh, a comedian like silent film comedian which he wasn't the only one there's a lot of others um at that point you're living the history you're not looking back on history you know what i mean you're not like i'm one of the greatest silent film comedians of all time you don't know that <laughs> <laughs> so in his life i think he was trying to still make make it out there and make a name for himself as it were and uh it's just coming this movie's coming out um right after Harold Lloyd's uh, other feature called Grandma's Boy and also The Kid a couple of years ago by Chaplin, both of which are, at the, even at that point, giants of silent film comedians. And I don't know this for sure, but I feel like he must have felt like I need to do something like that to, to have some grandiose epic story that isn't just about the gag because a lot of his shorts and even Three Ages is a collection of stories that is kind of filled with just gags. It surrounds this uh the take but the story itself is kind of like you know what i mean it's not uh cohesive you know i think this that's why this our hospitality movie works is because he's finally a movie where from start to finish is a through line you know there is some propulsion of drama and propulsion of weight of character and so you're just arriving at this movie where it's like fully fully drawn out like that and that's why he started out the prologue with uh, very dramatic scenes uh inspired by dw griffith because it's it's there's no gags right and by the way that baby in the beginning is uh it's they his, call him jimmy it's his uh firstborn joseph yeah. or james they call him mm -hmm. jimmy and um when the two sort of family members were for shooting outside that specific scene i thought was very artistic like the lightning would flash and then you could see the gunshots in the dark you know what i mean yeah i thought it was great it was almost like a modern movie. Like that was great. Know. Yeah. Have you guys seen Equilibrium with a uh, Christian Bale? Yes. So, in that movie, um, the uh, Christian Bale's character would use um, uh, sort of like um, like gun, like gunplay, uh, martial arts almost. Like you, you would play with guns gun food. and shoot people. Yes. Yeah, like as if that was like a martial arts skill, you know, using guns like to 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 as if you were a martial artist. So I think, all right. So essentially, um, that is what's happening um, with that particular opening scene. I, I felt that the lightning sort of um, going out and then the the guns blazing. I felt like that was. I'm not saying it's exactly like Equilibrium, but <laughs> I well, always like you know, to tie it to modern movies, you know, yeah, so that people understand that, a little that's bit. That's a really important point to make for sure, because like you can watch something like, I don't know, like the Raid and the Raid 2 and just how far like we've come in, in terms of like pushing technology and in filming even like choreographed fights or gunfights, all that stuff. Uh, but you're right. Like you can show this, the, the opening, if you add like people actually speaking, um, I don't think people would think this is a film in the 20s, at least in the very first, uh, the very first like 10 minutes or so, first act, um, mm, and then it sort right. of goes into the the silent era film uh, comedy, which I, I'm not saying that is like a detriment. I, I really like those jokes, but you're right, like right. It, it still holds up very well, and it's a very cinematic moment. And we, I think we we had we had that feeling when we watched the General as well. If you recall, Bob, I think you made you made a note that this didn't feel like a movie from the nineteen twenty six or twenty seven. This felt like a movie from like yesterday. You know, it, mm -hmm. that movie was shot so well. But, so basically, mm -hmm. our hospitality 
the, the reason why I'm linking the two is because our hospitality is like a practice run. <laughs> right. It's like his uh, demo reel to make the general, basically, which is hailed as, of course, you know, well, I don't know if you know, but it is hailed as one of the most uh, uh, well-known or best popular or whatever best movies of all time. It's on many, many top hundreds everywhere as a, as not just a silent film, but just film of all time, you know, the general by Buster Keaton. But it, if you watch that movie, it's like, you know, depth of focus is everything super clear and it's super steady. It's like before the steady cam was invented. And I mean, think about how he was able to shoot the train scenes right on this, on this particular, um, movie how he how much he had to think about what kind of would you be on carts or would you have two train tracks and put one camera on one train while shooting the other train you know there's all these logistics that yeah. i think he's figuring out here that um that he wasn't previous to that so yeah you can imagine seeing him at the drawing board laying it all <laughs> out trying to figure all it all out, out. I also think in that a little bit more about the prologue is that all these weather stuff, he often does that in general throughout his both dramatic and comedic shorts is the weather, like many great filmmakers actually, like Kurosawa often does that too, is the weather can evoke the emotion of what whatever the character is feeling. So like both of those characters are in a dark sort of mood and the weather is kind of sort of indicating what's going on the torrential emotional torments and in, in the inner turmoils are doing right which is like of course with our modern context eyes are like oh that's a little you know upfront. <laughs> <laughs> but back then that's kind of how they had to do it right because it's based on sort of imagery um another thing i noticed was i don't know if you noticed that hey because you've seen a lot of silent films is you re- did you uh recognize the tinting that it wasn't black and white but rather yeah had... yeah i did see that i, I was okay, perfect was was that like a co- common thing with a couple of these films yeah so tinting was common um there are multiple ways of tinting um there are ways where you physically take coloring markers and tint the actual film so oh, okay, the early you. early days 1910s 20s and you have to f- tint every copy so not just the original you can't dupe color you have to tint mm-hmm. every single copy of the film you're going to release so if you're going to duplicate 100 prints to 100 cities every uh feet of those 100 film prints are that you're going to duplicate you have to manually color in the actual film the actual film yeah you know the only tinting i recall seeing in the film was in the opening scene when he he brushed out the the lights yeah but that's the thing is that the it's mostly set in amber and then when the lights are out it's like the 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 bluish you know Mm -hmm. tint where it represents darkness, right? That's the most common thing. But with this particular film, the films like this, uh, Code actually came out with a pre-tinted film. So if he's, you could actually shoot in uh, using a specific tinted film as is. So when you shoot that, it's going to come out as, you know, dark blue or amber. Um, but I think there was specific scene in the prologue where I think it was the McCoy character. He blew out the the candle or the lamp uh in interior in in the house and we blew it out it turned from amber to you know dark blue so that must have been an after effect and what that does is that you, you have to take the original film neg- negative and soak it uh into a chemical that turns it into a different tint that you want and so then he'll make a cut so he'd edit the actual film where before he you know take the light out it was amber and you make a cut there and then you join it with another film negative where it's now dark blue, which is dark, right? So that's how you do it. Does that make sense? Hey? Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, uh, so especially like, like the coloring in on the actual yeah, film. <laughs> I, I think the reason why I wanted to highlight that, no pun intended, is because I, I wanna you to understand that ever since the dawn of films, these filmmakers, including Bust and everyone, they've always wanted color and they've always wanted sound. It's not like they disliked it. They just didn't yeah. have that technological <laughs> capability. And I feel like even at the beginning, you could see their feelings of like wanting all that in there. You know what I mean? So just the FYI for silent film sort of, you know, watching, you could see that all of them really want and desire to have all those things. Uh, they just didn't have those 
technology available to them. And if you ever see, sometimes they are experimental color. Uh, still photogra- color s- uh, photography has been around since the late 1800s, I think. Um, and they've done some actual color uh, photographs of these film sets. And they're like, like the, f- the colors are fully realized. I, I had no idea. Sometimes these, I don't know why they would do it, but they don't like dress them in black and white. They dress them in like fully decked out colors. You know, the set design and the, and the costumes are really well done, even back in the day. Uh, to ac- accentuate, I think, different hues as it shows up on the film neg- uh, on the film itself when they're shooting. Yeah, you could tell how great the costumes were. I looked up the, who the designer was, and it was a man named uh, Walter Israel. And apparently he did about five other well-known silent films, including one about Abraham Lincoln in, like, 1930. Because even, you know, it's like, even in black and white, it's like when we watched within our gates those costumes were so nice it's the same thing you can tell when there's quality to what they're wearing despite you know if it is in black and white and however old it is yeah even then they weren't kidding around when they're Mm -hmm. when they're doing uh film production it wasn't just thrown together you know so it it, it was their job is the way they're making money and so um so moving on so after the prologue they basically sent the kid off and and just very small scene here but i love the scene where i don't know if it was the parents it was not very clear who it was there are a bunch of there's an old elderly couple sending the mother and the child off the mckays in their carriage it's a very sort of brief scene but to me it was very cinematic like the way shot the angle and to me, it was like Buster kind of growing in in his director confidence. I kind of noticed that, that too. Yeah. Yeah, and and there's another scene later on when the train is passing from the right to left, and there's like a a, a, a shape of a cliff on the left, and you got clouds in the back, uh, presumably blue sky, and clouds way beyond the train track. Like mm. the the Maison scene, which the word hasn't even invented yet to apply for <laughs> films. Is so incredible the the framing device to evoke emotion, to evoke story, to tell. Mm. And I think that's what's interesting about this film, is that he wants you to be invested in these characters before he throws the funnies on. Right, he wants mm. you to make sure that the film's through line from start to finish, uh, they're significant, they're important, they're not they're not just gags. You know, I think that's the departure that Buster Keaton's making as a career move. I think. Because before, I don't think it really mattered too much. It was just like gag after gag, and the characters are like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but I think there's a lot more thought in this film, uh, more than any of his other features before that. Um, and I think this is where his uh, his sort of, uh, uh, you know, from here on until sort of after the general, his, he's got about a good 10-year spike of creative sort of uh, streak, I think, you know. Um, anyway, so moving on, um, I love how when they're at New York City and Trenton, it's all farmland because remember it's like 1810 mm-hmm. or 1830s at that point, 20 years later from yep. 1810 was when the prologue happened and 1830s is when the, he grew up. So he's like 20, 20 years later, Willie McKay is now in 1830s and even 1830s, New York City and Trenton and Tri-State area, it's like farmland. <laughs> it's not like Times Square, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> So when you see a sh- shot of that, you're like, this is New York City? That, okay, That was stunning. <laughs> that was stunning. Yeah, and, and supposedly it's uh, down to the historic I, details. They Oh, yeah. I want to do a capture on that yeah. scene. <laughs> I want to yeah. save that as a photo. It's well-researched. Yeah. And when we're introduced to him, of course, he puts his you know, tall top hat on, which is not his normal pork pie right. hat. Right. Um, that was amusing. Yeah. And it's like, because normally Buster Keaton... Just like uh, Harold Lloyd has this that sort of stylistic pork pie hat, like everybody knows, yeah. is associated with his character. But he's he's doing something different here. And I think even these little choices, they're so it, minor, yeah, and yet speak so loudly about what he's yeah. trying to do. And yet he has his same geometric um, way of thinking where he puts the hat against the roof and then slides that's it underneath exactly, it. That's yeah. what he was, the, po- the whole point, right? He was making a... A point that ah, this is not going to fit, so I'd rather do that. And I love how he put some black marker or something chalk on there, where his face would be marked up with black something. <laughs> <laughs> like when when he's doing the hat thing, he's you know doing against the roof, and the hat, the hat comes down over his head. <laughs> it's a funny gag, but when he takes that off, it's it's, it's all dark. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but that bike there, um, it's called a dandy horse and there's many other names, but if you need to Google or what it is, it's called a dandy horse. That's the predecessor to the bicycle we know today. And apparently I didn't fact check this, but it's in the, uh, DVD bonus behind the scenes people. So I assume they did. <laughs> it was so historically accurate of a replica that it, you know, Buster donated to Smostonian. Oh, it's wow. Like a historic wow. thing. So, so interesting. That is cool. Yeah. You know, the other thing about the the train scene with the top hat was uh, the girl and the way she played the role I thought was so funny. Like, the fact that she was non-responsible, like she looked at him like, you know, she might have laughed at him, but no reaction at all. She just sort of looked at him like, okay, and then stared ahead again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually found that funny. I, I laughed. I said, "Okay, she's well, like you could see not the impressed." Relationship blossom <laughs> through the ride of. The so there was course. nothing, yeah. right? But there was nothing there. It was like he was being—he was funny, not intentionally funny, but he was being funny, and she just didn't react at all. She's just like, "Okay, <laughs> whatever." <laughs> yeah. Although I have to say, though, uh, I don't know if you all thought this, but the. When the moment that, you know, his mom's saying goodbye to the McKay character and he gets on the train and the moment she shows up was the moment was like, OK, so she's got to be from the other family. Right. And it's like the whole Romeo and Juliet theme. There, like, well, to me, in hits. my mind, I was like, there was no way that that girl is not the other family. There's just no way. Like plot wise. You know what I mean? I That didn't hit me. Honestly, that didn't hit me until the letter her brother and her father received the letter. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, because, you know, if you've seen a lot of these Buster Keaton shorts and stuff, right? it has to work that way. It's, it's small world. In my mind, Very like, small world. When she showed up, I'm like, she's not just some ancillary character. There's there's no way she's just unimportant. <laughs> you see the, the fact that she's you see the you know, his wife the in real life, right? Natalie <laughs> Tomich, like... Yeah, she's going to play something significant, you know. <laughs> I, I, I will, plots within plots. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with the other two on this one. I, I didn't realize it was going to be a thing until the letter. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe it's just me then. I have too much inside knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if I've seen this before, to be honest. I mean, some you of these the films Oracle. I've seen, uh, I don't remember half of it now. I'm getting too old. <laughs> so... um. All right, so yeah, so on to the train scene, and in 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 all of the train scene, um, the uh, before we get to the train scene, I thought that when Buster's character uh, William McKay is reading the letter about the house inheritance, I love how his imagination doesn't match up to the reality of things. This is further down now, but uh, and I just love the editing of that. Um, I'm not saying that other films didn't do this, but I found it interesting that Buster likes to use this effect, this editing to his effect, where in his head he's imagining this large mansion. I love that house. scene. That made me so laugh so hard. But that then, made me laugh so yeah, hard. Yeah, and his emotion too, as a character. And then when he actually physically sees the house, <laughs> his imagination of this mansion blows up like the model. <laughs> that was so the house funny. <laughs> Yeah, Boom. I laughed really hard when I saw that. Like, you knew something was going to happen to it just because of the way it was paused on the house. Right. And then <laughs> <laughs> he realizes his dream estate is a dump. It was right, great. Right. Well done. But, you know, that might not be as funny to you, hey. <laughs> <laughs> might be a little cheesy. But, you know, that's, you know, that's one of those things about the films of this era is, you know, that's what they found drama to be back then it, it drama and melodrama it often the blinds kind of blur as they were making these films i don't think it's until years and perhaps decades later looking back that some of these films uh will shed some of those you know um sort of uh sort of criticisms against whether or not they're melodramas or dramas you know what i mean so anyways like in its time I'll give you another example uh, in our more recent time, I guess. Uh, it was in it. I feel like there's many movies like that. Yeah, there are Terms of Endearment. So, oh, right, right. In 1983, right. it's by James Brooks. And 
it's I think it's still a controversial movie, but it's one of those like cheesiest movie like ever made. <laughs> and when I've seen it, I'm like, this won the Oscars in 1983 compared to Big Chill or the it, right stuff. It is a chick flick. Oh, chick flick. Ugh. It is definitely a chick flick. <laughs> well, and that's probably why I haven't watched it. Shirley, I'm not into Shirley chick McLean, <laughs> Deborah Winger, Jack Deborah Nicholson, yep. Jeff Daniels, Danny DeVito, John Lithgow. Big cast. Yeah, Anyways, big cast. Huh. I'm only bringing that up as an, illustration, as an illustration that melodrama still existed in 1983. Oh, yeah. It's a super cheesy movie, and it still won the best picture. <laughs> so just the FYI that it's not totally divorced from <laughs> the 1920s and 30s. No, just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Moving on. Um, let's keep going here. So I thought that house gag was pretty funny. It was, I love a lot. Of, there's a lot of setups and payoffs. There are a, long, a lot longer stretches because it's short movies tend to be like, I set it up five minutes from now and then t- uh, I set it up five, ten minutes ago and I'm going to pay it off now, you know? So the interval of the setup and payoff would be a lot shorter. You get five to ten minutes and you get the pay it off, pay off, the uh, setup and payoff. Whereas in this movie, the setup at the very beginning of the prologue, they had this uh, Love Thy Neighbor plaque and the payoff is the very f- one of the final shots of the movie, right? Where the dad looks at the Love thy neighbor plaque, right? Do mm. you remember that? Beginning and yeah. end. Yep. I really liked how they tied that in too with the ending. Right. So that's what I'm saying is that payoff is the entire stretch, the setup of the, the whole movie, and the payoff is at the end of the movie. That's probably one of the longest stretch of payoff, setup and payoffs that he's ever done. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But it, 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 all these little things are things where he's – trying to become a more serious filmmaker instead of just Mm -hmm. a gag person, you know, that he's mostly known for, I think, still. That train that he created, um, by the way, got loaned out to Arbuckle, um, who at this point is disgraced a little bit because I don't know if you're aware, hey, but uh, Arbuckle was famously uh, accused of murdering somebody. um, Oh, Even though, in theory, he did not. And there was a whole trial, the whole like whole like media circus. You think media circus is now, and it still was back then too. And it was like they're accusing him; he's the murderer, he's the killer. But he's basically blacklisted from Hollywood. He basically can't make another movie again. Fatty Arbuckle. Yeah. And he was basically next to Chaplin, one of the top guys, basically in silent film comedians at that point, uh, up until that point, nineteen twenty-two, twenty-three. Anyways, after that words, he couldn't really make movies under his own name, so he used okay. pseudonym. And that scandal Buster basically King. killed him too. Yeah, the career. So he continued to make movies, and he made a short called "The Iron Mule" using the train that Buster built for this movie. In oh, fact, that's right. The rumor is that Buster himself played like an Indian, dressed up Indian, in that movie, uh, <laughs> "The Iron Mule." But anyways, this uh, uh, train is based on um, a sort of inventor Stevenson um, from UK called a rocket, and that's why if you pause the the screen the the movie you could see the rocket it's labeled right on the engine the engine itself was modeled at that in the u.s there's a dewitt clinton version of the same exact train uh except that it uses horse carriages is strong used horse carriages and sort of more like wooden buckets so the uk version wasn't as comfortable of ride but the u.s version has a, a more comfortable ride and so what Buster Keaton did was he took the engine from UK and the carriages from US and put them together in this movie. That's his invention. Nice. That's that's really awesome. Again, like goes goes to the how creative he was as as an engineer filmmaker. Um, yeah. And he, um, what 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 do you guys think are the funniest gags from the train scene itself? Uh, my favorite is the carriage guy just falling off. <laughs> his father <laughs> uh i think that was another uh oh, 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 so character actor who okay. has been in his shorts before but his father is the uh, engineer okay. his, his father was the guy standing at the front oh, like staring off into space yeah, like exactly. standing like a statue okay um my favorite gag on the, on the train in the train scene any of the train scenes I mean, I like that as I didn't real. I was trying to figure out who his father was. I liked as the con. Not was he the conductor? Or just the train. Uh, he's driver? an engineer. He's engineer. shoveling the wood into yeah. the, the yeah. train yeah. and fire, right. and he was cooking food at one point. Yeah, yeah, that was funny that the too. The train was like detached, <laughs> but, which is tap appears again in general, right? So, 
Yeah, the, the guy with the the guy with the trumpet in the back who fell off who the fell off guy. while he was sleeping. Yeah. Yeah, I love that part. He, he just uh, literally was sleeping and then. <laughs> I thought. Yeah. I thought I found it pretty amusing. Um, well, aside from the dog chasing the train all the way down, but I found when the when the the tracks for some reason was going over some unsteady ground and they literally went up down up down up down like like. I, I, it was not a smooth ride. <laughs> well, it, it was like I, I didn't even know how to describe it. it. It was so. It was like a staircase. I mean, it was like a staircase flattened on the ground, and it was, it was like up, down, up, down. So seeing it go up and down those was was that rather amusing to me. Yeah. I said, "Is it going? Is this going to actually work?" And I had to watch it to see if it would work because when they showed the tracks ahead of time, before the train got there, I I said. Is it actually going to go over that? <laughs> I, I love. I also love the way he shot it. I think he shot it in right, whatever speed he is, and then he sped the film up. And if you look that in detail, every time they're going over the bumps or doing those visual gags and effects, they're speeding it up to make the passengers look like they're totally thrown off and uncomfortable. And they are, but I also think the actors are making us believe that by acting that way too. Like they're right. the actors are Accentuating throwing it. themselves yeah. in mm. regular speed as he's filming it, but then when you speed the film up during those scenes, it's as if they're like they have Bouncy. whiplash basically. Yes. Up and down and back and forth, back and forth. So it's all maximized for comedic effect. Um the dog I thought was gonna get run over at some point. It's kinda dangerous. I think some of the train could go I up was, and down yeah. at any point and it could have gotten killed maybe it's like you know stunt dog number three <laughs> I, I was wondering i was like is this setting up for the dog to be ran over by the train <laughs> yeah. that would, that would be gruesome turn. <laughs> yeah. that'd, be, that'd be a different turn <laughs> yeah. um, I, no my favorite gag was when uh the the train split on the tracks i, I thought that was a pretty um well, yeah, like, thought out joke. Um, yeah. Some jolly joker was just there and wanted to like play a game on them. Yeah, I don't know who that was. He, I don't just, know who was. he just split the train and then ran off like, oh, yeah. <laughs> job <laughs> done. I do, I do love the, the nonchalantness, uh, the nonchalantness of that guy where he's just like, well, what am I going to do now? And he just sort of <laughs> like walks off. <laughs> Um, while we're here, this is probably some of the, uh, uh, Natalie Tolmage, uh, who plays the girl, uh, who is married to, uh, Buster in real life. She already had the first baby who obviously shows up in the prologue, but she's actually at this, the, during the course of this film, she gets pregnant with kid number two. So she's not doing the stunts towards the end of the films. <laughs> Because yeah. he's now pregnant, basically. Like so, at the waterfall, it was. Uh, yeah, is that it was a doll. <laughs> yep, that was a doll, actually. That's yeah. He was uh, Buster was real, but he was catching the doll. But um, yeah, so they towards the end of filming, they try to hide her pregnancy and stuff like that. Uh, Natalie Tolmage is the second sister of Norma and um, Constance. Uh, Norma being now, the older, and Constance being the third. Now, and all three of them came from super uh, poor families. Yeah. And I think I, as a result of which, God, I, I'm right to say that the baby in the beginning that was him was his baby. That was Buster's correct? real life baby, correct? Yeah, so I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. So some background about Natalie. Um, so she's kind of the second sister, and all three because of their poverty. I think somehow, I don't know. I'm reading this too much. I, I haven't read their autobiography or bios or anything like that. Um, but what I've no, uh, read at least is that th when they sort of now grew up in, in the entertainment business I think they kind of pivoted over to the other side where they become kind of overspenders because now they're into fame and fortune and they've gotten rich over their film career all three are in films and silent films especially Norma she's kind of a giant of the silent film era uh, actress wise and um, she's married to the producer Joseph Schenk, I think I don't pronounce his name, but he's often mm -hmm. at the the beginning title, opening titles of a lot of Buster Keaton movies. So with a lot of power, fame, and fortune, and all three kind of expected this lifestyle. And ultimately, for Natalie, she's the one that kind of broke Buster because he he 
had to be buying like the best homes and the best neighborhoods, buying the best clothes, the best stuff, and ultimately kind of bankrupted literally. Hmm. Really? Uh, yeah. It, it, even as that's why, like, with one film, the general failing to make money, that alone put them put him into poverty. In fact, after the second baby was born, she ma- Natalie made. This is probably the best that their marriage is going to be uh, on this film. Probably the last moments, unfortunately. After this, they would move into separate rooms and just basically not be in each other's lives, even though they're living in the same house. And if he had affairs, he'd just kind of keep it private and not embarrass her. And it was only a few, uh, 15 something years later, they would end up divorced and stuff like that. So uh, unfortunately, you know, it's tragic again to their relationship. Uh, but and uh, Buster Keaton would end up being alcoholic for uh, five, ten years, and then would get married, and then got sobered up, and then he would have another second or third part of his career doing something else after that. But he never really regained the same sort of artistic control of his films as he's been during this era, from this all the way through the general, I think, and even the cameraman. Total background. But just giving you some backgrounds on who these people are outside of the film careers and why they're kind of significant to this movie and what it's capturing. At some point, it's a it's a fictional tale, but it's also capturing a moment in time in history in in their lives. You know what I mean? Because you hear stuff like they're playing baseball, they're having fun. It's almost like the best times of their lives now. But then you know their history. It's like oh, it's gonna all go to bad stuff <laughs> after this. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so, anyways, um, any other uh, sort of gags on the uh, the train sequence before we get into the New York City or the town or the city? I mean, I, love the I guy. liked. Go oh, ahead. sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, go on, Lily. All right. Well, I mean, I liked. I don't know if you were going to say this when his father and some random guy just start throwing stuff at each other because he wanted to play. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, his stuff I was like, "What is this dude doing? Why is he being That's a what jerk?" I was say. Yep. Huh. He wanted to collect firewood. Yeah. <laughs> he's trading the rock. He's firewood. trading rocks for firewood. Yeah, he's saying, "All right, I got to get free, free firewood." <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, also the hobo or the bum he, that's just yeah. hanging out to the bottom he hops, of the train. Hops on. <laughs> yeah, In, inside the the, the 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 wheels of the train and stuff. And uh, I, this little piece is, I think, not familiar to us, but. There is a scene where a bunch of people just gather to watch the train go by. Do you remember that? You know, that's funny because it reminded me of my childhood. Um, my parents, my mom and aunts and uncles used to talk about how when she was a kid, um, cars were pretty rare, you know, in the 20s. And there was a main street in Somerville, um, Beacon Street, and they would run down to the corner to watch a car go by. <laughs> It was, it was, you know, it was rare enough that, you know, that they would wa- want to watch the car go by. And uh, when I was a kid, there were train tracks and freight trains would go by with like 30 cars. And I and I would r- and we would all run down to the tracks to watch the train go by. And so that scene totally took me back to my childhood. You're exactly right, because this is the first train that anybody's ever seen, not just them. Right. People. Because this, remember, they're they're inventing the trains. That's cool. That's so you're saying that like, the actual people in the scene are actually going to watch it, like well, I, the, this, like the people recruited for the movie may all be actually be seeing it for the first time as well. Well, they shot this in 1923, which already had many trains. Since oh, I see what you're saying. Started. Right, right, but, right. But the the characters are playing. The characters. The gag played. is that these guys haven't, these people haven't seen trains ever, and now they're gathering. Like, oh, look. Here's a train on a track. Right. And that's the gag because that's the context, right? Like without knowing some of that context in the 1830, where the train's steam engine had just been invented. Right. It would have just been a scene like, why are they doing that? Right. <laughs> yeah. That's mostly I thought they wanted to hop on and then they're like, oh, I guess it's full. Never mind. <laughs> that's what I got out of it. But right. that's because I didn't understand the context. <laughs> that's yeah. The context. That goes yeah. that goes to the level of detail that he liked to put in. Right. Great observations. So there's um, probably a lot more gags in the the train scene, but we can move on into when. The, yeah, I'll probably uh, have to like end this in about ten minutes. Yeah, we'll get there. So okay, the train, uh, you know, the, basically there's a uh, there's one more sequence where they go into the tunnel that's shaped like a train. That's pretty fun. 
but uh keeps going where uh so finally they're they're at new york city and um you know of course he he finds himself walking next to one of the canfields right what are the chances who is trying to go into the stores and this is supposedly kentucky so he's of course, you can walk into any store that has a backup gun. You happen to have a gun <laughs> on you that I can borrow for a few seconds to kill somebody. <laughs> See, right? So, I love that. And, of course, every gun, large or small, has to go through a lot of uh, reloads. <laughs> the powder, they load the powder in, put the, uh, you know, the, 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 I don't even know what you call it, but the gun pallet or ball or something in. Yeah, I'm not familiar I, with I don't know. I don't Whatever know. you call it. Um, just some, some side note: the dad, the father character, Joe jo- uh, Joe Roberts. This is his final movie. He had a stroke during the movie, and then he would die three weeks from the release of the film. Unfortunately, oh. hmm. so this is his final hurrah for not just Buster's families, but also for this film and his film career. Oh, wow. Um, what I love though is that when they're inside the house. Uh, I found that all the brother and the father were towering. They're so tall yeah. that they're towering over Keaton and Alan's yeah. character. Like yeah, towering, was, right? That added, added to the comedy. I thought um, it was funny with their char- with one of the brother characters. I don't know. I just thought every single time he missed, he was just like, damn! <laughs> the, I don't know if he actually said it, but that's just because of his certain outfit. You know, I just felt like he's a... Even though it's America, I'm thinking like a British guy being like... Right. Good show, except it's like, you know, damn. <laughs> I don't know. That's just where my mind went. Yeah, it's kind of like the uh, it, a lot of the fundamentals slapstick, right? You think that mm-hmm. term slapstick, that's where all some of this comes from, is that yeah. ch- by chance, by happenance, he keeps missing, killing this guy. That, you know, that guy time. made me think of a guy shooting at a, at like um, a town fair at one of the rotating duck things. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Those um, pea shooters. Yeah, exactly. There is uh, a scene in here where the Natalie character is at the bottom of the steps, sort of pining for the main character, McCabe, but it's kind of blurry. But the stairs are coming down the right. Like I said, it's very well framed. I feel like it's still, it's just very artistically done, I think. This this our hospitality the way he's shooting it, like every little sort of, uh, and you know what one of his cinematographers is Algin Leslie, which you know we've known that name from the past with a basically like a DP cinematographer mm-hmm. role. Um, they used to call him the cameraman for Hay, and he used to experiment a lot with cameras and special effects. And he worked pretty well with uh, Buster, and so he here he is again uh, returning on this film, working with him. So I thought that that specific. So shots, shots like that were all really good. Um, there are there the pocket watch when he has to wind it, he sits down and he uh, Buster King has to wind it. That's how it works, by the way. And I don't know if you guys ever had questions about that. I didn't. I don't have a pocket watch, but the pocket watches don't have battery. So if you don't manually wind it, it will go out of sync. You have to wind it once a day, and even mm-hmm. then, it's off by a minute, plus or minus a minute. Mm-hmm. And uh, you'd have to sync it with another timekeeper, a clock, or another mm-hmm. watch. So just FYI, if you if you don't know what pocket watch, I, yep. yeah, I didn't even know what he was doing when. That's, that's what he was doing. Ex- He's yeah. winding it. Interesting. Yeah. I had one of those as a kid, so but you know how it works. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm old that, enough that I remember doing that. Yeah, I had it as a toy. I don't think I used it to keep time, but um, I think that Buster and his gadgets, I think, is the theme. Of that the the point of those scenes and the trains and everything, there's another scene where he's trying to fish for smaller fish and he's trading for a bigger fish. That was a gag from another short <laughs> that we had watched before, and I can't remember which. But in the short, he he kept trading it, so he'd be like, oh, "I put this fish back on the hook," and you fish a bigger fish, and on and on it goes. I like the visual effects of the 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 water, the dam exploding as a miniature. Um, it's just so interesting that this is like a special effects film, you know, mm. and that waterfall set where the water is falling on him is the same set as the waterfall set that he built for the ending scene, basically mm. it's the same exact set, except mm. at the bottom, not at the top. So mm-hmm. it's dual purpose. 
you know, Neat. doing a, a, on the lot. It's not done in, in real, spoiler alert, it's not done for real at a real fall. <laughs> um, there's a scene in the um, Canfield Mansion where they're praying. And I love how all the different characters are peeking up sort of high, you know, as they're praying, they're eyeballing each other, right? Like the Willie's eyeballing the, the Canfields and the Canfields are figuring out, you know, how to kill this guy. And I just love that little scene there. Cause it just shows what the characters are doing at that point in time and what they're thinking, you know? So anything else at the mansion or the, the New York city, uh, not the New York city, but the, 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 the town and the house and everything around the area. Before we uh, move on. I thought it was so wow. goofy. Um, just a quick thing, how they, they were like, well, we can't shoot him in our house. We got to wait for him to leave. Uh, That's the central <laughs> title of yeah, our hospitality yeah. <laughs> is the fact that, you know, they're trying to play off of uh, Kentucky and supposedly the Southern hospitality. You yeah. know, apparently there's a thing where uh, it is part of Southern hospitality. You probably know more about this, hey, because we're all in the <laughs> <north>. <laughs> We don't know what, what it is down there. But is it true that Southern hospitality just – Basically, you can't shoot them in, in your house. <laughs> you know, Texas is a lot of guns, right? I've, you know, never, right? I've never ran into that. Um, That's but just not hospitable. Medical. You you should uh, ask around, see what yeah. it is, because, you know, big guns, right? So you should know in your state. <laughs> not very hospitable to kill someone in your house. <laughs> yeah. So, um, So that's that's kind of the... I found that particular scene funny. And of course, now there's the, the dress, uh, Buster Gang and dress escaping. Uh, we talked about that before, the gag, where the, the horse is, becomes that. But then I think it slowly winds into the the cliff. There he's on the cliff, and he's duking out one of the sons. And how he's got ropes with... He, 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 he got tied up with ropes with one of the sons. And somehow he, like, he would tug on the the rope and one of his sons would fall lands on a br- branch and then break the fall. And then he would pull Buster and Buster would then, I love that scene because you could see his deadpan face when Buster knew that the, the rope was coming down. And of course he triple knotted at the rope. Right. But his deadpan face was mugging for the camera. Like for sure. Like when he knew that, uh Oh, this guy's coming down, which means I'm going to get pulled down into the cliff along with him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I love that. I love that reaction on his face. Um, and when they finally fell into the water, I thought that particular scene was interesting because the water was so clear. You could see through them looking up at you. I thought that was interesting. It was, the, the water itself was super clear. You mm. know what I mean? Oh, yeah. No, it, it was yeah. it was a really good uh, little area they were in because you could see the, the very bottom of it. I, I was curious. I know. That was really cool. Anyway, let's finally come on to at the end here so where uh he you know ultimately was trying to escape um and you know long story short he ends up you know being on this river which by the way is a real stunt he was an actual when they shot those river scenes they're at uh, the uh Truckee river which is the lake tahoe river and there are rapids there in real life and as we're shooting they had to tie a rope uh, on Buster to, of course, make sure he doesn't uh, float away in the rapids. But that rope broke, and so he almost lost his life. <laughs> oh, jeez. Like, either hundreds of feet down the road or whatever in and, and the river, and they finally caught up with him, and he's like, he was, like, unconscious. So he almost died shooting the movie. <laughs> and uh, anyway, nice. I'm, I'm tying this to what I asked you earlier, hey, who I thought was the movie star the most of Brent Zendel's. I've mentioned this before, but he's probably more like Tom Cruise who likes to perform those crazy stunts for like the Mission Impossible <laughs> movies. Yeah. That's yeah. Buster Keaton in a nutshell from back in the day where <laughs> if he, it's not performing in front of the camera, it's not real, you know? Yeah. For him. It is a good comparison. <laughs> so, I mean, this guy almost literally did die a few times where Tom Cruise is still alive. So <laughs> I'm not saying that he he's, should die. I'm he's just trying. He's trying his yeah. best to, you know, Tom Cruise going to space in the next Mission Impossible. He's doing his best to yeah. go as crazy as he can. But yeah, Buster Keaton, <laughs> it would be interesting to see how he would how he would fare in this playground. He'd be like, yeah, just go ahead and 
put some fireworks on on a train I made, and we'll see what happens. And hopefully, yeah, I don't because blow he, up. you you can't cut with him. He's yep. so sort of stringent about that. He he wants the effects to be, all be in camera. You know. <laughs> hey Bob, I know you got to run soon. Uh, do you have any? sort of thought uh, you know remainder of the scenes and the films or overall sort of thoughts about the film before you had no, i think i think you've covered it really well and uh all all the parts that, that i that i loved were uh, we've pretty much talked about so okay all right okay, bob. good, good night bob. everyone Bye. thanks bob talk to you later see you bob so I, I don't really have much more left beyond that except to say that the the waterfall we got to talk about um uh, because it was intercut with real life waterfall, not the one from the uh, Lake Truckee, of uh, the Lake Tahoe one, rather, a river running off of that, but some other sort of high waterfall where you, you throw the boat off and, you know, the, the boat would dash against the rocks just to juxtapose uh, the scene against the waterfall that's built into the set. So most of that waterfall scene is on a set. Um, and you see constructions that the you the really neat I think angle was that you had the camera looking out from the waterfall against him and also looking at the background. Well, all that background looks real, but it's in fact was a miniature. So that sort of you know the camera overlooking the waterfall itself, looking as if you're looking at like thousands of you know, almost miles down on the on the, the the over the cliff, like what you think is like real trees. <laughs> and landscape and scene that's just miniatures so i thought that was really cool yeah i I was a little bit worried watching that scene because i knew a couple things like uh were were actually filmed uh in real like areas like real uh the real environment and i was like did they risk two people's lives on a waterfall just for the scene Uh, up up the river (laughs) was real but uh yeah, all of the yeah. waterfall scene is all on the set. That's which, yeah, I, I was a little bit worried. Yeah. I was like, man, if if <laughs> anything had not worked out on the set. Yeah, but it's still like it's still pretty high up. It's still like you know something like thirty, forty, fifty feet up. And if the rope broke, you'd still get pretty injured. Uh, yeah, there might be nets down there, but still, you know, it's not. He of course will do everything as safe as possible, but he did. You know, he he has risked a lot more life and limb. I think uh, he, he probably another uh, illustration would be somebody like Jackie Chan modern day mm-hmm. yeah you know, yeah for sure so that stunt guys who was broken some bones or something in his body so anyways so that waterfall scene is definitely a, a highlight of this film and it, it really placed this movie in sort of the classic realm and in very high favors um and of course it wraps up at the end where you know the the parson character rescues them marries them and of course i love that the ending that all of them had to put down their guns because now they're married, but you know, Buster's armed to the teeth as well. You know, <laughs> he's like, you would like at the end, remember when they're married and everybody puts the brothers and the father puts down their gun, and then Buster's, oh, okay, I think we're safe now. So he, <laughs> he finishes taking up, he, you know, brings out all the guns that he's emptied out of their gun closet, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's so it's so intriguing with some of these things because. It's like that's that's a joke that was you. I can't remember which film, but that that's a joke that's used over and over uh, oh, now. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, they're sort of innovating in some ways uh, this humor because uh, you you see that there's like you know something like a a twelve year old going through um, uh, a metal detector and then they have all these weapons and it's you know it's always a humorous thing, but it's just yeah. interesting because like you do not expect the character um, to have like any weapons whatsoever and he's just armed like to the to the tooth um ready to take down anyone with like i i want to say at least 10 10 rifles or not rifles guns uh ready but yeah i think that um this um sort of my parting thoughts about this is that if you look at the uh, they do rate classic films by the way on rotten tomato and it's 96 percent on there oh nice um it has more in common with uh, the general than any of the other other features because it both features trains heavily as a centerpiece of a set. They both visually um, recreate a lot of the details, because the details of the historic sort of details of what's going on in that time, like New York City and stuff like that back in the era. And um, it also experimented with techniques, filming techniques and gags that you reuse um, on this movie. It's kind of like training up for the general in some ways. 
and you know how to film that in motion in Oregon and he would go back to work on to film the general in a much smoother way I think it was still very not smooth on this film whereas by the time they got to the general he knew exactly what he needed to do these are like trial runs basically pre predecessors of those and also thematically there are a lot of similarities where um, you know both both films would have trains going with smoke oh that's the other thing that was funny was the train going through the tunnel oh and everybody uh, having made everybody smoke yeah on the, yeah <laughs> <laughs> but that scene would be repeated in general um but in that scene in the general would be all on fire and they both have top top hat gags and they're kind of like cousins these two films and it, it's about southern southern sort of genteel lifestyles you know willie mckay is more like johnny gray in the general um and than any of the other keaton's uh leading man roles um so and there's also a family feud in both films there's a hero has a epiphany when he overhears uh, enemy plotting and so eh, there's a lot of similarities between this one and the general which is also a classic a more refined classic three, yeah i'm three, definitely interested down the road. to check out the general now yeah, the best, if you can, I don't know what Canopy has, but the best version of that is the Master of uh, Cinema copy from um, UK. Uh, you'd have to import that. I don't know if it's streaming anywhere, but that's got the best pristine uh, picture quality. Um, this Criterion you'll have a, a release of that? Uh, I don't know about Criterion, but Kino is, has the rights for Buster's so film, film. Yeah, I thought I'd seen this on, on their list before. Um yeah, I don't know, but um, the film rights all are dispersed everywhere, I think, yeah. in general. <laughs> but anyways, so if you needed to have the best picture quality, that's the best one. It is also that's really it. hard to get because um, you have to import it. Um, the copy I have is actually the Kino US copy, which is now probably more than a decade old. And it's based, on, again, on an older remaster. Just all about the general, by the way. So like I said, Buster Keaton is... You know, one of the greatest silent film comedians of all time. He stands tall next to Harold Lloyd, uh, Harold Langdon, even I think, and also uh, obviously Tra Chaplin. And these are the three, four names that often pops up when you talk about silent film comedians. And so all of his films get a lot of love, and they get a lot of restorations, multiple restorations actually. <laughs> so, anywho, I think that's pretty much. The film. What do you th do? You have any parting thoughts, Lily, before we wrap up? No, just that you had mentioned about Talmadge and how she kind of wrecked Keaton's life. Because I was wondering uh, <laughs> if this was the wife, because I knew he had a several that kind of did him in. Yes, this is the one. Definitely, this is the one that did him in. Yeah, because he Cause... would marry uh, Eleanor later, who uh, would be the kind of the. The, the third stable, wife. Yeah, the final she's like wife the stable would, one. Also yeah. the youngest one. He's like, right. they said she was like 23 years younger than him at whatever year. And I was like, ooh. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, I you know. Things back then. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, for, for the film itself, too, their acting was really good. But, you know, it's the same thing. The bubble's not about to burst quite yet. So you can kind of tell that. You know, they have some kind of chemistry, but I don't know, now knowing everything that happened. Because when we were talking about One Week, was that the film that he was making digs at her? Do you remember? I know oh, we talked about it. That was, um, I'm not going to remember the name now, but there was a um, short where it was uh, a Rolls Royce. And he had to, on the camera, on screen, destroy a Rolls Royce that natalie tallinger or their family gave them oh one of the first rolls, rolls, rolls royce ever made first models oh my just god destroy it <laughs> <laughs> just for kicks yeah but yeah that's one of those shorts in there i i can't remember the name now it escapes me but yeah um, same we'll put it in the show notes <laughs> that's our answer to everything we remember <laughs> this stuff but we'll th we'll link in the show notes later <laughs> we'll try to at least <laughs> yeah all right. Um, hey, any parting thoughts? Uh, I, not much besides everything we've covered. I mean, it's a really fun uh, fun watch. If anybody, for whatever reason, uh, 
got to this part and is still on the fence of watching this. Uh, it's just a, a really uh, well-written comedy that, that holds up well. Yeah, we typically don't have spoilers because we figure it's like close to 100 plus years, some of these. Like, if you don't, if you yeah. haven't gone around to seeing this by now, <laughs> <laughs> there's no point in doing spoilers anymore, I think. I don't know. <laughs> so, all right. Well, I think that'll uh, wrap up uh, today's podcast. Uh, thank you very much today, hey, for joining us. Um, hopefully, it was uh, enlightening for you as well as entertaining. And uh, certainly had fun having you on our podcast, uh, picking your brains about what your perspectives into silent film era from sort of a more modern perspective. I think a lot of films of, of your particular podcast has been about, but um, hopefully it's opened some of your eyes about uh, what silent films are about and um, come some, hopefully some context too that uh, we provided to, to help you enjoy this and many other silent films uh, down the road. And um, you can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. Again, that's watchingsilentfilms, plural, .wordpress.com. You can send us an email at watchingsilentfilms at gmail.com. And, of course, if you wouldn't mind leaving some feedback and ratings on the Apple Podcasts or any uh, podcast platform, very, very much appreciate it. And, uh, hey, where can we find more of your stuff? Uh, yeah, so for podcasts, uh, we're pretty much everywhere. At this point, um, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, but the thing that I was going to mention at the end of this, uh, if you're interested in hearing me and a bunch of other people talk about films, and maybe these guests at, at some point, hopefully, um, you can find uh, a bunch of YouTube stuff uh, at All That Film on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash all that film if you want to, you know, just get to it straight away. Oh, um, wow. You got that URL. Yeah. I'm jealous yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, have, you have to cross a certain threshold to I, get that URL. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we do reviews for, for modern movies. So like your Parasites, your Endgames, your um, – trying to think about it. Like Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, and we try to do pretty much anything, whether it be, you know, mainstream releases or small indie films. Uh, so, you know, I, I try to tell people the reason it's called all that film is because we do all encompassing amounts of film. Uh, we try not to have too many uh, spots that, that we've left untouched, but yeah, we definitely have a, a little blind spot on, on silent films. And, and hopefully uh, within the next month, there, there might be a video essay uh, that, that I'm doing on, on silent films and in sort of an intro to that. Cause I feel like a lot of people have, a little bit of trouble because cause they're like, oh, well, where do I even start? And I'm not going to like these. You know, there's even movies for kids nowadays in, in the 90s that they're like, this is weird. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. Uh, I do enjoy your podcast, by the way, even as a listener, because I feel like it's kind of like your own personal sort of diary that you yourself, but also your gang of sort of fellowship of people kind of have just about perspectives on, like, as your podcast suggests, all that film, you know, all those topics about all that film. So I really enjoy that, uh, even as a listener myself. So for sure. You're yeah. also on many of the top, top, you know, top uh, film podcasts out there, too. So great list out there. So thanks again to our being a guest of our podcast. And uh, thank you, Lily, for uh, posting stuff up and managing and producing podcasts. And um, it's, it'll be edited by me, Fong. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, have a good night. And uh, we'll talk to you. Uh, later. Have a good week. Thank you.